Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our risen Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Congregation may be seated. Dear friends in Christ Jesus, this morning being the day of Reformation, the day in which we celebrate this, I'm going to take you back about 500 years. It was a time in which was very difficult to live in. It was a time when there was death and despair all over. People were afraid of demons, of ghosts, of, of, of all kinds of, of superstition that was all around. It was a time that truly was filled with despair. It was a time in which the infant mortality rate was nearly a third of all children being born. It was a time in which you were lucky to make it to adulthood. Only about a third of people would make it to that age. There was plague and famine all around. It was a time that was difficult. And even for, and I'm going to introduce you to Martin Luther. He grew up during this time, during this, this, this point in which things were all around. He was born to a man that loved him very greatly. But yet at the same time, he was a disciplinarian. As he grew up, he had to study and he had to study hard. <clears throat> in fact, if he didn't, there was punishment to be had. Not like the punishment we have today where maybe it would be a swat on the rear end or sent to time out. But it was said that if he failed in his studies, the blood would flow. It was a time in which most people were illiterate. Most people did not live, uh, they, they basically worked menial jobs. But if you dared go to college, if you had the ability to do that, <clears throat> if you could read and write, then there were really only three, uh, three areas of study. First of all, you could study the sciences. Second of all, you could become a lawyer. And third, go into theology. Well, Martin Luther, as he entered college, chose to go into become a lawyer to study the law and so he had a good grasp on what the law meant as he had grown up he knew what it was like to be in a legalistic situation <coughs> and then of course the, the, the thing that most people had to deal with was the church the church had told people and had that the only way of salvation was in order to take a few coins and put it into a box. You see, he told everyone that they were sinners, and we all know that we were all sinners, and they were all doomed, uh, all doomed to purgatory, thousands and thousands of years in purgatory, where what they had to do is they had to work off and they had to pay for the many sins that they had in their life. And there was no way out. Oh, unless you put a few coins in the box or you had someone in your family that would put a few coins in the box maybe maybe they would be able to to take away a few thousand years of suffering and and penance but nowhere did you see a loving God in fact God was somebody to be feared God was someone that was jealous and vengeful. Always seeking to take those out that didn't believe in him. Well, Martin Luther knew that and, and understood that. And so he went into the law. But yet, one fateful day, one day in which there was a thunderstorm, the heavens had opened up. And it wasn't just a regular thunderstorm, not like the one we, we just kind of had a few minutes ago. But it was one in which the lightning came. And where he was at, he was out in an open field and, and everywhere that, that, that he could see, lightning bolts were striking the ground. And it was so bad that he had feared for his life. 
<clears throat> and so he made a promise, a promise to God that day that if he spared his life, then he would go into the ministry. He would become a monk. Well, as we know today, Luther survived that thunderstorm. And he followed through on his promise. And he went and he took all that he had and he sold even a very expensive law book that his father had given him upon entering into the, seminary, into the, into the university. <clears throat> and so he started studying theology. And he worked his way through. He worked as a monk and he eventually became a priest. And during that period of time he studied, he studied an awful lot. He studied the books of the church. He studied the early fathers. But the one thing that he kept coming up with was the same thing that the church was teaching. The teaching at the church at the time that God was an angry God. That he was an angry judge always seeking to destroy those who did not follow his commands. But Martin Luther... As he studied and he tried to, to meet the commands of God, he realized that he could not do it. There was no way for him to be able to, to, to be good in and of himself, if not perfect, which is what God commanded. Perfection. That's what God calls for. And so in order to try to make himself better, to try to do it, we, we know the story about where Martin Luther tried to, uh, he would beat himself. In fact, one time he beat himself so much that he was within inches of death. Because all he saw was an angry judge. Oh, he sought to look for a loving God, but he didn't do it. Until one day in his studies, as he was studying for his doctorate, he found this book covered in dust. It was leather bound and it was somewhere back in the back of the church library. And so he pulled it out and there he read Romans chapter 3. And he also read those words of Ephesians. Those words that are there. That all of a sudden showed him a loving God. For we are justified by faith. We are justified by grace through faith in Jesus Christ outside of any works of our own. You see, what he come to realize through that was that there was no way for him to be able to earn the favor of God. There was no way for him to be able to earn his way into heaven. But what he did see there was a loving God who through his, that sent his son, Jesus Christ, to the cross in order to take on our sin. In order to make us free. You see, that's the reality of it, isn't it? That's exactly where our gospel lesson takes us. We see Jesus here talking about, uh, talking about the truth. The truth here in the Word of God. We see, see Jesus telling those who believe, He says, if you abide in Me, you will be My disciples. And you will read the truth. This Word is truth that's here and it will set you free. You see, that's exactly what Martin Luther was. He was captured. He was a slave to that sin that he had. He was a slave because there was no way of him being able to get out of this servitude. That sin that's in each one of us, that sin that's in the world, and that sin that controls our lives. You see, what it does is it takes us captive. And it's just like Paul says, it's, it's, it's that thing that happens that the things that I want to do, I do not do, and the things that I do not want to do, I do. And you know, that's exactly how it is for us too, isn't it? Are we just like that too? The things that we want to do, we don't do. And the things that we do not want to do, we do. How about this? We don't want to necessarily hurt somebody's feelings or that. But what do we do when we gossip? What do we do when we say, those, say words that we may not really mean, but we say them anyway? Do we hurt those who are close to us? Isn't that a result of sin and being captured by sin? We don't want to do it, but many times we get caught up into it, don't we? 
How about those times that that, that we don't want to kill anybody like I said we don't want to hurt anybody and what we do is in anger we we say words that we shouldn't is that being captured by sin we know that we should be in church and we and, and we want to be here and we we, sh we desire the Word of God but when it comes to doing our devotions do we always do them are we faithful in that you see, that's the problem is, is that we have the same problem that Martin Luther had. We are all captured by sin. If we allow sin to be there, to be at, it becomes our master. We become the slave to it. And the more that we try to resist it because we aren't perfect, because we cannot live up to the Ten Commandments, the commandments that are on the wall back there as you leave, We become a slave to it. We can't resist it. But that's where, that's where the Reformation comes. That's where Martin Luther looked at it and he saw the Word of God and it set him free. Just like that same Word of God, when we hear it, it sets us free, and free too. It sets us free from that sin and it, it releases us from the bondage of Satan. And allows us to be able to live as God's people with the truth. You see, that's the thing about it is, is that today, in, in today's world, how many people think that they have their own truth? How many times do we hear different people saying, well, what's true for me may not be true for you? And it's a very confusing time from that because where is it that we find truly what's right, what we should do? You see, it's that kind of thinking that ends up taking and puts, puts us and binds us to sin. It's not anything new today. We take a look at Pontius Pilate when Jesus was standing before him. And he, and he says to Jesus, he says, what is truth? It's the very same problem then. Everybody had their own truths. But that's where Jesus tells him there is only one place of truth, and that's in his word. That's in his very word of God that sets us free, the word that says that we are justified by grace. In other words, it's by Jesus Christ alone that he, has, <clears throat> that he had grace upon us, and he went to the cross in order to take our sins on himself. And it's there that that word comes to us that says you are forgiven. In fact, in our hymn that we just sang just a few moments ago, A Mighty Fortress, it talks about one word that can fell Satan, and that's the same word that does it all the time, and that is this word. You are forgiven. It's through forgiveness that we are set free. And it's in the Word of God that we have that truth. A truth that we can hold on to, and we can live, and we can stand up to anything that, that Satan would have. But you know, that's where we gave a look back at Martin Luther. Because we never really know what God has in store for us. We never truly understand what, where God may take us in our life. Because I guarantee you Martin Luther didn't set out to change the church. In fact, on that day in which he put the 95 Thesis, the day in which we, we call the start of the Reformation, all he wanted to do was have a debate. Little did he know that he would be brought up in front of all the leaders of the church before council and pope. And that the words that he was speaking that he thought was going to free people, that was going to change the church, that was going to do all this, that was going to bring truth to the people and was set them free, would put him in a situation where he may lose his life. You see, because the story went on. He continued to write. And he had written 25 booklets that talked about the truths of God. Well, one day he received an invitation to the Diet of Worms in order to stand up in what should have been just a simple debate. But it wasn't. 
In fact, there was a, such an invitation that was given to another man about a hundred years before that. His name was, John, uh, was Jonathan Huss, and they invited him to come to speak about what he was doing. And it was the same things that, that Martin Luther was trying to bring to try to reform the church, to try to get the church back to where it was speaking the truth of God. Only that particular one, what they did was they invited uh, the John Huss to come in. They said, we'll give you free passage and everything. They brought him into the chamber and they said, said, you've been saying some things about the church. We think that you're a heretic. And he says, no, I'm not. But they said, yes, you are. They closed the door and they decided to have a barbecue. Only he was the thing to be barbecued. He was burned at the stake. That's how the church dealt with it. Well, they invited Martin Luther and he came in and as he walked in, as he was there, they said, uh, Jonathan Eck came to him, John Eck came to him and said, are these your writings? And Martin Luther said, yes. And he says, well, I want to hear one word from you and that's called revocal. Do you recant? And of course, Martin Luther, knowing the history, knowing what happened to, to, to Jonathan Huss, knowing all that said, says, well, you know, I need to think about this before I give you an answer. So they told him they have until the next day at five o'clock. And so the next day, Martin Luther was brought back into that same chamber, and he was brought there, and Jonathan X said, these are your writings right here, these are 25. Uh, these 25, he says, revocal. Do you revoke? Do you recant? And that's where Luther stood there. And he said, unless you can prove to me by scripture that the things that I have written here are wrong, and that I don't put it up to popes or councils, which they have been known in the past to err, that I cannot in good conscience recant. Here I stand, I can do no other. You see, what we have to realize is the truth of the Word of God and understanding that he was a child, was, was a child of God, was someone who was under that, it get, freed him from that sin and that fear that sin, death, and the devil brought to him. And so he was able to stand up there on the truth of Jesus Christ, on the true word of Jesus Christ, and said, I will not recant. He stood up against them and said, I will not recant. This is the truth of what God says. And see, the thing about it is, is that in our lives as well, how many times does the world out there want us to recant our faith? How many times does the world want us to say revocal to Jesus Christ? How many times does it want to say that there's a different truth out there? You see, my friends, here we have been freed because of the Word of God. As His disciples, that we abide in His Word and He's freed us in order that we can stand up to the world in the same thing. He's freed us so that as Satan attacks, as Satan comes and wants us to sin, that we can say, get away from me, get away, stand behind me, Satan. I stand on the solid word of God. You see, it was through those words of Jesus Christ where, where he came and he said to each one of us that we have been baptized into faith in Jesus Christ. And it's through that holy baptism we've been claimed of his own and we are that's right, we are absolutely children of God, and so we stand in the truth. We're his disciples. And we're not slaves out there. It's the Son, we have to realize it is the Son himself that has set us free. And if the Son sets us free, then truly we are free. Free to stand on the word of God. Free to stand up to the world and tell the world, revoke all to you. I'm not going to live by your truths. I'm not going to live because the only truth is here in the word of Jesus Christ. And that's what sets me free to be able to face it. That's what sets me free to be able to, to say to you, get away from me. 
That's what gives us the strength and the power, even though they might take our house, our home, our goods, our honor, our wife, our child, even our own life. Because we know as children of God, we've been set free and we have eternal life. That standing on the word of God and, and faith in Christ alone, it's there that we see that loving God that has claimed us as his own. And that's what it is. It's not the jealous God of the early church. But it's the loving God who has called each of you as his own. And yeah, even though we're not perfect, and yes, sometimes we fall, it's in those times that we hear those words that fill Satan. Those words, you are forgiven. That's what sets us free. So go, live your lives in Christ Jesus. You are forgiven. In Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. May the peace that passes all understanding keep our hearts and minds centered and focused on Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We now take our tithes and our offerings and we lay them before the Lord.